What's the story of Morning Glory? What is the word, Hummingbird? Thank you so much for clicking on my channel and for joining me for this review of Love During Lockup Season 4, Episode 28, Jailbait and Switch. So let's start off with Jessica and Dustin. Now, Jessica, she is our former Department of Corrections nurse who quit her job so that she can date Dustin, the inmate. <sighs> So she is on her way to visit Dustin in prison um, after she had kept telling us in previous episodes that the prison system is conspiring against her and Dustin and will not allow her to have a visitor's pass. Now she's able to go visit him. So we see her driving to the prison to go to go see him and then she gets to the prison cameras are not allowed to go inside the prison but we see her three hours later she comes out she immediately calls Dustin's sister and tells Dustin's sister that she has been terminated which means that her visiting privileges have been terminated have been canceled the prison has canceled her so she can no longer go see him and because she is no longer an approved visitor or on the list of visitors for Dustin she can no longer send him any money and she can no longer have any video visits with him either so she thinks that this has a lot to do with her being a former employee of the Department of Corrections and I guess they look down upon people who used to work for them and no longer work for them I don't know if they look down on people who quit for whatever reason or if they look down on people who quit just to date an inmate but whatever the situation is she claims that there's some type of a you know conspiracy against her um to prevent her from seeing her her boo so I don't know so she says that during the visit she had to ask him some very hard-hitting questions and one of the questions that she asked him was whether or not he was still using and he did admit to her that he had slipped and that he did partake in some meth so here we are later on when we see her she is visiting uh, no, her friend is visiting her. Her friend comes over. Now, her friend, who's also a nurse, um, is one of the most logical and sensible people that I have seen on any Love During Lockup or Love After Lockup franchise because this woman was dropping some serious knowledge. She was telling Jessica. So Jessica tells her, tells her friend that Dustin has been using meth in prison and this absolutely devastates Jessica. She's crying on her friend's shoulder because I don't know what she was expecting or what she thought because when you look at Dustin, he looks like a user and she was working in the same prison that he was housed in and so she was seeing him quite frequently I'm assuming so I don't know why she doesn't see what the rest of us see he looks like a user he looks like someone who partakes in drugs even though there's no a, a person can argue there's no specific look because you have lawyers you have doctors you have professionals who are users and you would never know it okay but maybe they have the wherewithal to know how to hide it but Dustin with the tattoos all over his face the size of his I mean he just looks like someone who uses so I don't understand why she's so shocked and even if she thought that he was not a user once she came in to find out that he was I don't know why she's so surprised and why she's so shocked so she tells her friend that, you know, Dustin had confessed to her that he was still using meth and she's absolutely devastated. She's crying and boohooing. And the friend tell her, tells her, well, you know, because you're a nurse, you're a saver. You see someone who's in trouble and you feel like you can fix them or that you can save them. Um, and she also tells Jessica, and you think that you're in love with him, but you're really not. And she tells Jessica this is not it for you. Okay, this is not a good look for you at all. Um, once he's released, he's going to be a good boy for about a month. And then he's going to go back to his old habits. He's going to go back to hanging out with the wrong crowd. He's going to end up using you for money. He's going to use your money to sustain his habits. So this is not good for you. And so I don't know if Jessica is listening to any of this. 
I don't know if it's just going in one ear and coming out the other. I have no idea. But her friend was dropping some serious knowledge on her and trying to convince her that this is not what you want, Jessica. You deserve much, much better than this. And you can't fix everybody. And you really, you really need to evaluate your feelings for this man and figure out if you're truly in love with him or if you're just in love with the idea of being in love with him. Moving on to Justine and Michael. Now, Justine and Michael... This is the couple that got married in prison, even though he had like a couple of weeks left um, behind bars. She was still insistent on them getting married before he was released. And I've already gave my theory on that. I think she wanted to marry him before he was released so that she could make sure that they got married. Um, I think that she was worried that if they waited until after his release, he would try to come up with all kinds of reasons and excuses of not getting married. So she wanted to trap him while he was still behind bars. So we also saw in last week's episode that in celebration of their nuptials, he had bought her, I think it was a Mercedes. Um, I don't know if it was brand new or used, but he definitely had bought her a Mercedes. He surprised her with a Mercedes. Um, she tells us that he has also bought her very expensive jewelry. He's also had bought her very expensive steaks, the steaks that you eat. So she doesn't question where he gets his money, but everybody else around her is questioning. So her cousin, Mariah, had come over. This is last week's episode. And Mariah had asked her, well, where is he getting this money? He is behind bars. He's been incarcerated for like six, seven years. Where is he getting this money to buy you a car and all of these other very expensive luxury items? So... Where we're at now, she's waiting for him to call her. You know, she's trying to keep herself busy by cleaning up, washing dishes. He, she finally gets the call and um, he basically chews her head off. He's upset with her because her cousin was asking him where he got his money. And Michael thinks that his money is his business. He doesn't want people asking him a damn thing about how he's making money. And he, for whatever reason, he's really upset with Justine because of the questions that Mariah was asking. And he tells her, you know, you need to tell your people what's up. Let them know that how I make my money and what I do to get money is nobody's business but my own. Um, and then he's like, are you the FBI or something? Are you an FBI agent? You know, sending people to ask me how I'm making my money. He was really, really upset. And so she tells him her questioning you is very logical because you're in prison. OK, and the last anybody's heard prisoners don't make that much money to be buying luxury cars left and right. So her question was legit. She's looking out for me. So her asking you that there was nothing wrong with that. He didn't like it at all. So later on, she FaceTimes Michael's sister and we find out that Michael behind bars has started a shoe company, a sneaker company. He's selling sneakers online. And Justine, I guess, is also a part of this company. I think she also helps him out with this. But it's like, damn, what is like him being in prison? Like he's so he's like so productive in prison, more productive in prison. He is when he's free, because when he's free, he's committing crimes. But then when he's behind bars, he's like selling albums starting sneaker companies buying cars like he's extremely productive behind bars so justine doesn't believe that the money for the car came from the sneaker company because she knows how much money they're making from that company i guess and because they're their partners in that company she said it's like me buying my car for myself buying the car for myself so it didn't come from the sneaker company um so she was asking the sister, like, you know, my people are, I don't know how she phrased it, but something to the effect of, you know, I'm wondering how, or my family's wondering how Michael is making money behind bars. And I don't think the sister gave an answer. If she did, it wasn't a straight answer. And so, um, the sister also happens to mention to her that she is not the first girl that Michael has bought a car for. So Justine was like, excuse me? He's bought cars for other girls. And the sister says, well, you know, he had a whole life before he met you. And she was like, oh, OK, because I was feeling really special. I thought I was the only one that he had bought something so extravagant for. So now there's women out there running around in cars that Michael bought for them. And then she asked the sister. So when they broke up, did they have to give the cars back? And the sister says, no, my brother isn't like that. He's not going to give a gift and then not and then take it back. He's not like that. So they're still driving around in the cars that he bought for them. 
So Justine is unhappy about that. You know, the fact that she is not the only one that he has bought cars for. So she ain't that special. This is just what he does. Uh, Michael just likes to flex. He just likes to show off his money, however he's getting it, whatever he's doing. Um, that's all that is. I, Michael would buy, you know, the next door neighbor's dog a car if he could. Moving on to Emily and Dowry. So Emily is the one that has power of attorney over Dowry. Dowry is the inmate and she's got power of attorney over his finances. So whatever money he gets, she has complete control over it. And she thinks that she's scamming the scammer. She thinks that she's pulling the wool over Dowry's eyes, that she's conning him at his own game, but she's really not. And so she's on the phone talking to Dowry and she's um, letting him have it. She's telling him, don't you ever in life um, talk to your friend Smoke ever again because he disrespected me. I don't like he came at, I don't like, I did not like how he came at me when we met up for me to give him the money. He was very disrespectful to me and you're going to have to choose. It's either going to be Smoke or it's going to be me. So Diary calls his homeboy Smoke and he tells his homeboy Smoke, look, you know, what, what went on between you and Emily? Uh, Smoke tells him that she was disres disrespectful to me. I didn't like how she approached me. And then Diary, the inmate says, look, Look, if I have to choose between my girl or you, I'm going to choose my girl because she's family and she's the only one that's been holding me down and blah, 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 blah. And Smoke says, well, if she's been holding you down so tough, how come she has never come to see you in the three years that you've been behind bars? And um, he says, oh, she's got, you know, uh, she gets panic attacks when it comes to going to prison, you know, and visiting people in prison, she gets panic attacks and anxiety and all kinds of stuff. That's why she's never come to see me. Okay, that's what you want to believe, Dowry. So um, basically, he told his homeboy, I'm choosing my girl over you. And that's that. And Dowry's like, okay, whenever you get your census, whenever you get your census back, you know, holler at me. Moving on, Chelsea and Mikey. Now, Chelsea is um, the one who is hard of hearing and she is dating Mikey. And so she is on the way with Mikey's mother to go see the lawyer because Mikey's mother, Pamela, believes that her son's rights were violated when he had his stroke and the prison did not take it seriously enough to call him an ambulance or to give him the adequate medical care that he needed at the time. They instead just threw him in, they put the handcuffs on him and they threw him in a van and they transported him to the, I don't know if it was an actual hospital or the prison hospital, I don't know what was going on, but whatever was happening, his mother believes that her son the prison did not react in the proper way when her son had his stroke. So they're on their way to go see an attorney. Now, while they're driving to the attorney's office, now Chelsea's hard of hearing. Mikey's mother, Pamela, does not do sign language, does not know sign language. Chelsea's driving the car. And so in order for her to understand what Mikey's mother is saying, Chelsea has to look at her because she knows how to read lips. And so... I was looking at this whole scene and I was like, this is a little bit on the dangerous side because she kept on turning her head to look at Pamela while Pamela was talking. And I mean, her eyes were not on the road. Okay. Her eyes were not on the road. And so I felt like, I mean, I had so much anxiety watching that scene because I mean, she would like, sometimes she would turn and look at her lips moving for like a good I don't know, five to 10 seconds. And you know, an accident can, ha can happen in less than a second. So that was a very anxiety inducing scene for me to see that. Moving on. So now they are at the lawyer's office. And I think it was a little bit difficult for Chelsea to keep up with all the lip reading because the lawyer and the mother were talking to one another. And, I, you know, Chelsea just didn't know who to look at or what the hell was going on. Then the lawyer turned to her and asked her, well, who are you? And Chelsea says, I'm good. <laughs> So I don't know what happened there. I don't know if uh, she, uh, maybe her lip reading skills are not up to par. I don't know what happened there. So the mother introduced the lawyer to Chelsea and blah, 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 whatever. So they're going over all of the felonies that Mikey has racked up. And Chelsea is absolutely shocked that Mikey has so many damn felonies. She didn't know how many felonies he had, and she didn't know that he had been in prison before. So there's a lot about this man that she claims to love with all her heart and soul. There's a lot about him that she just doesn't know because she doesn't ask any questions. Okay. She doesn't ask any questions. So, 
Mikey tells the attorney what happened during his strokes. Like I said before, he had a stroke. Um, he was feeling really, really dizzy, very, very nauseous, uh, to the point where he, um, collapsed. Um, he called, you know, he, he brought, uh, he called the, whoever was in charge to let them know that he wasn't feeling well or something was going on with him medically. And instead of taking him or instead of calling an ambulance for him, they handcuffed him and they transported him to a hospital. Uh, when he got to the hospital, the people in the emergency room, they saw that he was handcuffed and they were like, take these cuffs off of this man. You know, he's having a stroke. He's like in dire medical. He has, he he's in dire medical need. Like take these damn handcuffs off of him. So because the prison were, de they were delayed in getting him to the emergency room and so on and so forth. Um, I think they're trying to build this case that maybe his stroke would not have been as bad as it was if the prison would have acted quickly and promptly. Um, I think that's what they're trying to build their case around. Um, the lawyer believes that Michael's civil rights were definitely violated and the lawyer is willing to take on the case. Now, Pamela, Mike, Mikey's mother asked, well, how much do you think we could get? And the lawyer was like, I, I, I don't really know. And when Pamela asked that, I was like, okay, Pamela, I've already figured you out. You, you're one of those people. You live off of lawsuits. It seems like you live off of lawsuits. You can smell a lawsuit a mile away. So she seems like the kind of person that, you know, she knows how to file law because she was so quick to be like, oh, we didn't go see a lawyer because, you know, the prison didn't do, didn't do something right. Now, the funny thing is when they were talking to Michael on the phone in the lawyer's office, you know, Michael was talking normally and... I always thought that people who've suffered a stroke, like a major stroke, that they their speech is slurred, you know, that part of their face is paralyzed and so they can't speak as well. That's what I always thought. But he he talked normal. He sounded normal, but whatever. So um, the lawyer said he's willing to take on the case, but he's going to need fifteen hundred dollars up front. And so. I'm thinking this is the reason why Pamela was so gung ho about Chelsea accompanying her to the lawyer's office because she either wants Chelsea to pay for it or she wants Chelsea to help her pay for it. And so Chelsea's like, you know, me, I have no money. <laughs> I'm broke. I don't have any money. Um, later on, Chelsea's talking to her friend and telling her friend that, you know, um, there's something, something, you know, the prison did something wrong to Mikey. You know, he had this stroke and they weren't treating him right. And, um, I'm really upset. And she talks about, she's gonna, how she's gonna exact revenge on the prison. The people who were working at the prison at the time, she's going to do something really wicked, but she doesn't want to say what it is on camera because she's got these very wicked thoughts and wicked things that she wants to do to the people who are in charge, um, in the prison that day that he had a stroke. I mean, it was just so bizarre, but the bottom line is, Chelsea's mom wants to file this damn lawsuit, but they ain't got no money to pay the lawyer. So we'll see what, um, how far Chelsea will go to get money for her man. Oh, and she also asked the attorney, um, because of his medical condition, because he suffered a stroke, um, is there a chance that he might be released sooner? Because he's got like, I don't know, five or six months left of, of his time. And the lawyer said, you know, it's a possibility. Okay. But he's got five or six months left. Um, the lawyer implied that the next time that he's up for parole, um, that's something that the parole board could consider is his health. But he's, is he going to be, maybe he's up for parole every month. I don't know. Moving on. I'm so glad that Mark and Censor Ray, uh, well, was towards the end. I don't have much to say about Mark and Censor Ray. They broke up, y'all. Mark and Censor Ray broke up. <laughs> it's so so tough to deal with um his mother came over for his 30th birthday he uh calls sensor ray on facetime or whatever he he does it on the computer she gets on the video call and she just starts berating him left and right um she really gave that man a piece of her mind she didn't like the fact that he has he, he's talking to other females in prison she didn't like that um she didn't like how he was trying to you know come up with these crazy ideas these wackadoodle ideas to get her released earlier for example you know trying to impregnate her by sending off his specimen to her so that she can get pregnant because he thinks that inmates who are pregnant are just automatically released they don't have to do any more time because they're pregnant he thinks that 
and um, he had called her lazy or he had implied that she wasn't doing enough for herself to try to get out early. And so she gave him a piece of her mind about that. She was like, uh, you know, how dare you insinuate that I'm not working hard to get myself released early. I've done all that I could, you know, um, I try, I, I did try to get an early release or to try to appeal my case. It didn't work. And so I didn't like how you were talking to me about that. And so she said also some things about, um, this is the reason why you, you, you don't have any women, you know, you can't get a woman, you only talk to inmates, you know, trying to talk about how he's got some type of a character flaw in him. And the whole time that she's berating him, his mother is right there listening to all of this. And then he says, you know, my mom is right here listening to you. And she was like, good. <laughs> and then he says something like, um, you know, my mom agrees with you or something like that. And she was like, well, your mom's a very smart woman if she agrees with me. And so while they're going back and forth, oh, then she talks about how she had blocked him, but then he keeps on adding himself back. I don't know to what, I don't know if she went on social media. I don't know if there's like a, a prison thing of, of people that are allowed to call. I, I don't know what she was talking about blocking him, but she goes, I keep blocking you, but you keep on coming back. And then the mother said, well, why do you keep calling him? And she was like, I don't know. I keep calling him because I think he's changed, but he hasn't. So Marcus and Saray have this history. I think they've been talking for like six months, but a lot has happened in that six months. So since Saray ends up just hanging up on him, She's done with him. And it seems like they've broken up because he tells his mom that he's going to be on the prowl for yet another inmate. I hope we don't have to see Mark again because he really didn't add much to anything. Moving on to Tay and Hadi. So Tay is on the phone with Hadi. These prisoners spend a lot of time on the damn phone. But then again, you wouldn't have a show if they didn't. Wow, they are always talking, <laughs> they're FaceTiming, video calling, um, they're outside partners. It's just like, wow. Anyways, so she's on the phone with Hottie. And she starts off, you know, really sweet and sensual. You know, she wants to do the whole, um, you know, dirty talk on the phone with him. And so it gets them all hot and bothered. And then when she has them where she wants them, she just completely unleashes on him. And he had said, you know, all these things that he wanted to do with her. And so she completely unleashes the dragon and she yells into the phone. Is this what you wanted to do to Boston? Is this what you wanted to do to Boston too? And so he's like, what are you talking about? And he goes, I, and then she tells him, I talked to Boston and Boston told me everything. She told me that y'all were getting married and blah, 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 blah. And Boston, Boston, Boston. Boston, me and her, we talked and she told me everything about you and her. And he was like, man, don't listen to her. Don't listen to Boston. Why are you, in, why are you letting that woman influence you? Don't let her influence her. She don't know. None of Anyways, um, Tay stuck to her guns. She was like, mm -mm, it's over. I don't want to talk to you no more. Don't call me. You're dead to me. You're dead to me. You're dead to me. She starts turning over, knocking over her own furniture. That's what I didn't understand. Like, why are you knocking over your own furniture? Like, what are you doing? But she's knocking over her own furniture, yelling and screaming into the phone. She tells him that you're dead to me. And then she hangs up the phone on him. And so she says that she feels um, relieved that she got to know the truth. Um, and so she's just going to go back to her Rolodex of prisoners and move someone up in his place. Someone else is going to be her number one. So we'll see who that person is going to be. Uh, and that's the end of the show. Y'all let's go back real quick to, this is just a very minor little side note, um, to Justine and Michael. What I want to know is Mike. Okay. So Justine has, she has an iPhone. But whenever she talks to Michael, she's on a flip phone. I don't understand that. I don't understand why she only talks to him on a flip phone when she has an iPhone. Anywho, that's my review of this little episode. Not much went on. Um, yeah, that's the end of that. Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it on your way out. Please do not forget to rate the video. And if you like this content, please go ahead and subscribe. And then I will definitely talk to you later. Bye.